Hello and welcome back to Sam's Finance, where I talk about personal finance companies and their stocks. After I was talking about a Bitcoin last week, we are getting back to a more conservative topic today. In this video, I'm going to compare stocks to real estate. Basically, what are the differences between owning 3M stock versus owning an investment property flat? Now, before we look at the differences, let's first look at the similarities so that it also becomes clear why it makes sense to compare these two investments. The first point seems too obvious, but both are investments. We are always talking about investments here, but let me define that briefly. According to Investopedia, an investment is an asset or item acquired with the goal of generating income or appreciation. Appreciation refers to an increase in the value of an asset over time. When an individual purchases a good as an investment, the intent is not to consume the good, but rather to use it in the future to create wealth. So both assets share the hope of a greater payoff in the future than what was originally put in. Both stocks and real estate can be used in order to either generate a stream of income or focus on appreciation. The latter would be typical growth stock investing, like investing in Tesla or Facebook. With the real estate, that would be like buying a property primarily with the intention of selling it later on for more. However, this is less common than being a growth stock investor. On the other side, both asset classes can generate a steady stream of income. With stocks, you can do this by investing in dividend aristocrats, for example, companies that have increased their dividend paid for at least 25 consecutive years and have therefore proven that they are reliable dividend payers. One example would be, as already mentioned, 3M. With an investment property, this income stream would of course be generated by the rental income after provisions for maintenance expenses, taxes and other costs. Thirdly, both stocks and real estate are subject to market fluctuations and other risks, as with every investment. More on that later. Now, let's get to the comparison itself. Category number one, accessibility. So how easy is it to get started with the two types of investments? The entry barriers for starting off in, with investing in stocks are generally quite low. And on top of that, they were significantly reduced in the last couple of years. Keep in mind that I am giving a general assessment here, mainly having in mind the European and North American market. So this does not have to apply to you. What do I mean by reduced entry barriers? On the one hand, I'm referring to the wide range of ETFs or exchange traded funds that are available today. They often come with small fees of maybe 0.2% per year and provide an inexpensive but well diversified and therefore easy entry into the market, especially for beginners. On the other hand, increased competition between brokers led to reduction of transaction fees, with the most famous example being Robinhood, of course, that allows you to trade without any fees. This led to a general democratization of the stock market. 10 or 15 years ago, here in Germany, for example, it wasn't unusual to at least pay 10 euros per trade in fees alone. Add subscription fees for traditional mutual funds on top and you understand that an order size of 1000 euros was the absolute minimum back then. Actually, for many people, this minimum order size was probably closer to 2000 euros, accounting for all fees. And this explains why the stock market has long been reserved for wealthy 
or high in income or high earning people. If you had 15 euros in fees and would have tried to invest 200 euros with one order, your fees would have accounted for 7.5% of the trade and therefore already deprived you of the return for the first entire year. That is, if the year went well. Today, with a 1 euro fee per trade or with savings plans completely free of transaction fees, in combination with fractional shares, it's absolutely reasonable and possible to buy even 50, to buy 50 or even 100 euros worth of stock. So again, for the record, the entry barriers to the stock market are today uh, really, really low. With real estate investing, this is still very different. Yes, we have seen attempts to democratize this type of investment by the use of crowd investing platforms, for example. However, this is still more a niche because you have to trust the platform very much and therefore you add this platform or issuer risk on top of the actual investment risk. Apart from this, one generally still needs quite a bit of knowledge and expertise to get started with real estate investing. You cannot simply buy a worldwide diversified ETF only believing in eternal growth. No, with real estate you have to make yourself familiar with financing, furniture and the laws of tenancy. Of course, you need more capital to begin with and actually also steady stream of income. Hence, it is not as easy as investing 50 euros into a MSCI world. Why do you need more capital to get, to get started? Normally, you need to make a down payment of around 20% of the purchase price to get a decent loan. So um, for a two room apartment that easily costs 150K uh, euros today here in Germany at least, you would need 30 grand equity as a minimum. Also to be considered and therefore not to be neglected are the closing costs for stamp duties, notarial costs, brokerage costs and costs for reports. These however vary greatly depending on the country you live in. In Germany these amount uh, to about 10% of the purchase price, for example. As mentioned before, you then also need a stable and preferably high income uh, to convince the bank of your creditworthiness and to pay the lowest possible interests. A quick summary. In terms of the accessibility, I only see advantages for investing in stocks. Number one, you don't need much knowledge to start off investing in index funds. When you start stock picking later on, of course, this changes. Where then secondly, you only need very little equity to start participating in the global economy. And this, of course, is also because of the little to no fees that arise. Lastly, investing in stocks is independent from your creditworthiness or income situation because you normally don't take out a loan for that. For the accessibility of the real estate investing, um, you normally have to and actually should take out a loan. More about this in a second. New crowd investing possibilities try to change this, however this concept is not yet widespread and holds its own risks. Uh, for this borrowing of money you should have a good creditworthiness that you get with a solid income. Employees therefore actually have an advantage over self-employed people here because their income is very reliable and predictable from the bank's point of view. Self-employed people often have to raise significantly more equity as a result of that. As a real estate investor and landlord, you have to have a broader and different knowledge base than an index fund investor right at the beginning. Lastly, the high closing costs also cause a difficult reversibility of the investment. With stocks, you can simply click sell, whereas 
real, with real estate, you have to pay attention to cancellation periods, transfer of the bank loan, and of course the search for a new buyer. Next up in this comparison are the risks that one has to take on for each type of investment. Obviously, the biggest risk is the total loss when you invest in a company that then goes bankrupt. However, this risk is almost impossible when investing in index funds. But um, if we really compare owning 3M stock versus owning an investment property flat, then this is a true risk, even though you can easily shrink this risk if you invest in 20 different dividend aristocrats, for example, so each one only makes up 5% of your portfolio. The most uh, probable risk is the price loss. You sell uh, for a lower price than you bought for. That would then be a partial loss. With real estate, it might seem pretty hard to imagine a total loss if you insured the property correctly against fire and natural disasters, for example. However, I can imagine even a worse case than a total loss for real estate. Imagine you buy a flat for 200k plus 20k in closing costs. You invest 40k of your equity. Then, after you repaid 10k, the area gets less attractive for tenants, um, what makes it harder to find new tenants, and you have to lower the rent um, so that the financing of the flat is no longer self-supporting and you have to support it with your regular income. Then you lose your job and consequently can no uh, longer serve uh, the loan installments. It then comes to the foreclosure auction where only a price of let's say 120k can be realized. After all this, you not only lose the flat, but also the 40k equity you deposited, the 20k in closing costs, the 10k repayment, and you still are 40k in debt with the bank. This worst case example is just to show you that with real estate you can actually lose more than your initial investment. This is because of the bank, um, of the bank loan's leverage effect. The next risk when investing in stocks is the psychological distress and the downturn where you see every day how much money you lost in just the past 24 hours. This is the disadvantage of the constant liquidity and this is definitely not to be neglected. Because with real estate you don't have this constant price ticker and uh, what you don't know can't hurt you. This can save you a lot. Uh, can save you a lot of sleep when you are a tense person. The illiquidity here is not really a true risk, but more a disadvantage in my point of view. Illiquidity can be a bug or a feature, as we just saw. A true risk, however, can be the tenant himself. If you let rental nomads into your flat. Um, then, depending on your laws, it can be quite hard to get them out again. Also important to point out is the risk that evolves from the amount of equity you have to put in one asset. With equity of 30k, you would have to put many, if not all, um, your eggs into one basket. With 30k in the stock market, uh, you can achieve a perfect diversification around the globe and across all sectors, which is of course then not possible with real estate. And coming back to the psychological distress, if truth be told, you can also get that with real estate investing, but here it's not uh, due to the volatility you're exposed to, but caused by the debt that might weigh on your shoulders and keep you up at night. As long as the apartment is self-sustaining, this might be insignificant. Now, before you lose all interest in real estate investing, I get to the last category, where I compare the potential returns of the respective um, investments. Of course, it makes little sense to compare the potential returns here, actually. 
From case to case, you can make better returns with stocks or real estate. But I would like to point out uh, a structural advantage that real estate investments have over stock market investments, and that's the leverage effect. Leverage refers to the use of debt, in this case the bank loan, to amplify the returns and more precisely to amplify the return on equity. The general requirement for a positive leverage effect is that your return on investment here in blue is greater than the interest you have to pay on the bor borrowed capital here in orange. In very simple terms, it does not make sense to finance an apartment where the rent you receive monthly is smaller than the interest you have to pay to the bank every, to the bank every month. As long as this rule is observed, your return on equity increases the more money you borrow. That's because you can rake in the difference between the return on investment and the interest on borrowed capital. Again, in simple terms, if you finance an apartment that generates 500 USD in rent every month after provisions are deducted, and you only have to pay 300 uh, USD monthly for redemption and interest, then why wouldn't you do this with multiple apartments or with bigger ones to generate a greater monthly cash flow? The more money you borrow, the greater the leverage and therefore the potentially greater the return on equity. Here again in green. Okay, okay, I get it. Enough of leverage effect theory. Uh, what does this all mean in concrete terms? Now, it means that with leveraged real estate investing, you can reliably generate 20%-ish return on equity yearly. With stock, invest, stock market investing, this is nearly impossible for longer time periods. Yes, you can easily get 20% in one year, but not reliably over 10 years. And there will be years with negative returns as well. The next objection I want to get out of the way is that you can also uh, leverage your stock investing as with options or trading on margin. However, these methods are way more risky because you can easily get margin called. And this is because of the greater and way more apparent volatility of the stock market compared to real estate. Therefore, investing on margin cannot be considered a respectable tool to build wealth. Before I close this chapter, I want to give you a final warning about the leverage effect. As I said before, its positive implications only apply as long as the interest on borrowed capital is smaller than the return on investment. Interest rates can rise and the rent payment you receive can shrink and maybe even stay out completely since you have to rely on your tenant. If these these things happen, um, the leverage effect switches sides and starts to work against you instead. Okay, as my university professor said, the take home message must be depicted at the end. Starting with the pros and the cons of stocks. Great accessibility. Low fees, low minimum orders, no income or credit worthiness necessary, and so forth. Then, easy to start without much knowledge. Um, yeah, when you use widely diversified products, of course. Then, easy to diversify. Um, as just mentioned through ETFs, for example, or small positions in multiple single stocks. Then, um, easy to manage. The broker is accessible from anywhere and you don't have to deal with repairs, provisions and so on. Now turning to the cons. Um, one con is um, the apparent volatility that can cause um, psychological distress. I think that's clear now. And then another con is um, the risky use of debt capital um, or margin. Yeah, we also talked about that just now. Then let's look at the summary for real estate. Uh, first pro is solid and steady cash flows possible. Similar to paying 
rent every month, you receive rent payments from your tenant. Next up is relatively low risk of leverage. Uh, we also just discussed this broadly and this leads to um, return on equity of 20% per annum being possible. In my point of view, this is by far the biggest advantage of real estate investing. I would even go as far as saying that without making use of the leverage effect, real estate investing loses out against stock investing. And that takes us to the cons of real estate investing. Um, more than uh, 30k in equity or as seed money is often necessary, um, more knowledge is necessary and uh, also think about the administration effort. You really become more like an entrepreneur uh, dealing with real estate uh, or just think of the search for a new tenant after the old one has left. And there you go. This is my comparison of stocks versus real estate. If you have more points to add, I invite you to do so in the comment section. And with that said, thank you for watching. You can help me out by subscribing to my channel. And remember, just be lacquer. Bye bye.